you. Um, today I just want to share with you some of my research because I think that um, a lot of these um, things that I researched uh, when coming up with you know, my paper and what I, what I wanted to do for my project, I never really looked into the world history of photography at all. Um, because I wasn't a concentration of photography, I'd had you know the intro to photography class, but as far as really looking into you know how a photograph was created, you know that was something that was interesting to me. And then you know I thought you know as a graphic designer, you know photos are so important. You know um, I will talk about this a little bit in my paper, but you know when we are talking about the success of a design, you know the one of the most important elements is the perception of the viewer, and so. Photographs in print, I mean, they're so important to us as designers and to us as consumers, you know, as people that are, you know, living in our world today. So as I was studying with Dr. Hendricks in the World History of Photography class, I realized what an important role that photographs began to play in the early 19th century. And, you know, from its birth, you know, people have been trying to figure out how to recreate, you know, these full tonal images in print, because originally, you know, we had lined illustrations. You know, people would you know, sit down and they would draw illustrations, you know, to go in these books and in magazines, periodicals, you know, everything from that time period. And so, you know, it was, it was reinventing that process a little bit because we had, you know, photographs, which was a milestone for art and science, you know, in the early 19th century. And so then that demand created, you know, um, the necessity, you know, of a new printing process. We needed something else to be able to, you know, put these photographs into print. So I realized through this project that I take a lot of things for granted. Um, I always used to tell people that I take my toaster for granted. I always get up and make me toast in the morning. And I, if I had to get up for a student symposium and tell you about a toaster, I would not even begin to know, you know how it works. But it's important to my life. And so I like to learn about new things. And that's why I took the world history of photography. I like to learn about new processes and try to uh, understand things that sometimes I take for granted. And I think my printer is one of the things that I take the most for granted. It's very important to my process as a graphic designer, but also you know, to the printing of photographs in the world history of photography. And you know, it mechanically solves a lot of the problems that um, it takes to get a full tonal image you know, in printed material. So laypersons like me around the globe probably underestimate the importance of printing a photograph, but the process is crucial. It's crucial to the success of our advertising industry, marketing, academic literature. There's all sorts of avenues that use photographs in print today, but the basics of that process still remain a mystery. So in my research, I wanted to investigate what I consider the most innovative printing process that's the predecessor for all other printing methods you know, today. And that's the halftone printing process. But before I talk about the process in general, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of photography because it was something that I thought was really interesting and I wanted to share it just in case you know, any of you wonder a little bit about that basic history. Um, the idea of the camera obscura has been around for centuries. And basically what that means is you have a light proof box with a small hole or aperture and so external images are projected into this box onto an inside screen. And that idea has been around for centuries. But actually capturing the image that's projected is something that, you know, that they had to figure out how to, how to do that. We wanted to be able to capture that image. And uh, one of the things that we always joked about in my world history to photography class, I always wanted to turn uh, our classroom into a camera obscura, uh, which is very possible. I mean, we light proofed this entire room and we poked a small hole in one of the you know, coverings that we had over the windows, we would actually project what's outside onto this wall. And it's, it's really fascinating how it works. And I always thought it was fascinating. That was one of the things that we joked about a little bit. But um, Nisiphor Niepce, he was, uh, succeeded in capturing the first photograph. And this is it. It's called View from a Window at La Grosse. And it's not very detailed. It took eight hours of exposure time. So you can imagine, you know, it was a long um, and grueling wait you know, to see if this was actually going to work. Um, but uh, he actually uh, was credited with the first photograph in 1826. Then his affiliate, Louis Daguerre, developed the daguerreotype process. And this process is accepted as the birth of photography, practical photography, you know, the idea of becoming a process. So uh, that was in 1839. Uh, the daguerreotype process, it used a much shorter exposure time 
and it reproduced exquisite detail. You know, where this is you know kind of blurry and something that we wouldn't see today. Um, you know, in our magazines, you know, the daguerreotype process it was crisp detail, and so um, from that process on, you know, photo photography has continued to progress into you know our time today. So after the invention of the photograph, then of course you know there was the demand for printing photographs commercially. You know, we needed a new process. So the methods up to that time, you know, it was only for lined illustrations, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, lithography. And so halftone printing was important because it would now make printing photographs possible. So the man behind the ma magic, uh, William Fox Talbot, who was mentioned in the salt print presentation, um, he is the one that's credited with halftone printing um, in 1852. And he had had some ideas about using a gauze screen and actually projecting um, the image through a gauze screen, but it wasn't until 1852 that you know, it's finally considered the birthday of that process. You know, he kind of fleshed out all the bugs. Uh, Talbot's new printing methods dramatically altered the way that people could view printed materials. Um, this process, through the art of illusion, created full tonal photographs that could be viewed in newspapers and periodicals around the globe, which is up to that time something that just wasn't possible. So after Talbot, there were a few others that um, aided in the progression of the process, and I just wanted to talk about them because I feel like they're important. Um, Stephen Horgan, um, his ideas were instrumental. This is um, an image, it's called Steinway Hall in Manhattan. It's one of the very first printed images um, that anyone saw. You know, even some of the other ones you know, around in here are drawings. You know, but the beginning of the halftone process, I just thought it was important to see this image. Um, this was in December of 1873, and it was a milestone, but his screens were considered crude, and so eventually, you know, they were deemed ineffective, and it would be always progressing. You know, in, in this field, you know, of, of art or in graphic design, everything's always getting better, always, you know, progressing. Um, in the 1880s, Max Levy, he marketed the first commercial screens. And so this was important because it made quality screens accessible. So after all these contributors, you know, the process just continued to progress into the 21st century today. So the demand that the invention of the photograph created made the invention of this process necessary. I think that's why it's important. Um, without the halftone printing process, photos might never have been viewed in some of the avenues that we see photos displayed today. Uh, newspapers, periodicals, magazines, textbooks, novels, um, other forms of printed literature often use photographs to draw our attention. But as a graphic design student, you know, like I told you earlier, you know, just talking about all the things that make a successful design, you know, half -tone, the halftone printing process was absolutely necessary, and I think uh, Talbot and some of the others knew that. So just getting into the process a little bit, I included an illustration. Um, I wanted to give you just the definition of the halftone process. It's a process that translates continuous tonalities of photographic prints or negatives into a series of dots. And different methods of mechanical printing are used to produce a print that simulates the continuous tonality of reproduced photographs. So basically, in layman's terms, this process creates a series of strokes or dots that to the human eye appear to be a continuous tone or a value. So this process works with the use of a half tone screen. And this is the actual dot formation process. Uh, what's light is coming uh, through the aperture. It's interrupted by a screen. This is this right here. This is actually the screen that's patented by Max Levy in 1852. Uh, so once it passes through that screen onto the light sensitive plate, it creates these little dots. That um, the, the way that he came up with the idea is he, he used a piece of gauze. And it would be like me you know, putting my hand in front of a projector. You know, it creates, um, it, well, when he projected through the gauze, there were these little dots you know, that were made by the material. And so he realized that that created an image that wasn't necessarily 100% accurate, but it could still be interpreted by the human eye. And that's because of our limited optical resolution. You know, if we see things that are, uh, you know, very, very tiny, very microscopic, you know, put together, it's like the cells on our skin. You know, we can't see the individual cells. We just interpret it as one solid surface because the, the tiny uh, parts are um, so small, you know, our optical resolution isn't strong enough to determine each individual pixel or each individual cell. You know, in digital, uh, our digital world today, you know, we use pixels. And the idea has been around forever, you know, using small things to make something big. And if you were to put any, any I mean, even our, uh, 
you know, the, the paper that we print on every day, you know, if you were to hold it up under uh, the strongest microscope, you'd be able to see little bitty pixels. You know, they're all formed together to make a whole. So that's basically the whole idea behind the process. You know, it's just they wanted to be able to create um, an image that would be easy to print. You know, because obviously it was really difficult at that time to think of creating you know, an image just from different grades. They wanted to you know, have um, a process that they could use you know, to interpret it. So that's the basics of the technique, um, but it's separated into three different types, um, and that is something that I thought was interesting. There's amplitude modulated, frequency modulated, and hybrid screening. Don't fall asleep. Uh, this is the most generally practiced process. It's amplitude screening. Um, <coughs> it uses you know just small dots you know to make up an image. Um, amplitude modulated means that the quality of the print is modified or influenced by the amplitude or the breadth of the dot size. So dots of varying sizes are used in the screening type to create a realistic photograph reproduction. And the problem with this is that some cheap or man-made screens, um, they can create dots that are too big, which makes it the, the image a lower resolution. You know, I don't know if you guys can tell what this image is, but... Um, this is the exact same image at a higher resolution. It's the same process, but there's more lines per inch. Um, that's a term that um, was used when, you know, I, I found it was used a lot when I was looking and just researching this process. It's basically the number of halftone dots per inch, per line per inch. And so in this process, there's more lines, more dots, you have finer detail. Um, so amplitude modulated screening is the most widely used in, to print photographs around the world. And it's been used for over a century, and it's still successful. Um, tonalities are recreated with smooth transitions in dot size. Um, you know, basically these dots form together to make an image. So the other type is frequency modulated. This is an example of the difference between amplitude modulated and frequency modulated. And the difference, obviously, is one is modified by the amplitude, or the size of the dots, and the other is modified by the frequency. So in frequency modulated, it's a lot truer to the original image, but that's only because all of the dots are the same amplitude. So you don't miss a lot of the details in the darker areas. With amplitude modulated, you have some problems because you know, it's the human component. It's the human component that causes that variant in all of the experiments that we did. You know, um, I'm in printmaking now. And so when you run things through the press, if you put too much pressure, you know, that ink starts to fill things in. And that was one of the biggest problems with amplitude modulated screening is these large dots. If you use too much ink or if you apply too much pressure, they would fill together. So the frequency modulated, all the dots are the same size. And so it was easier to create photographs or, or prints that were more true to the photographs because you had all the detail even in the darker areas. And the last type is hybrid screening. And hybrid screening is just a combination of both. It's amplitude and frequency modulated combined. And this process, um, it, it uses the strengths of both. Frequency modulated is used in the lighter and the darker areas because it keeps the detail, and then the amplitude modulated is used in some of the mid-tone areas where it's not as important to keep those fine details. Um, the only reason that people don't use frequency modulated as opposed to amplitude modulated, you know, we've all seen the newspaper images you know, where your face looks all crazy, you know, but it's because it's more economically uh, friendly to use the amplitude modulated. It's a lot more expensive to use frequency modulated. So that was really all my research. I just realized that I take a lot of things for granted, especially my printer as a graphic designer. I never really looked into, you know, what it really takes um, to, well, not necessarily today, but you know, just the existence of the process, you know, being able to print photographs, you know, on everything that we print on today, you know, just discovering what that process was like to actually get those photos into print. So thanks for letting me share that research with you.